On December 29th, Amber Fry, she was at a party and she was talking to some friends about like Scott and he's kind of, it's kind of suspicious, right? She's like just talking, whatever. And a friend that Amber's talking to recognizes Scott's name and tells Amber that he may be in connection with a missing woman. He then gives Amber a tip line number where you can call and like give any information about the case. So he gives that to Amber. So in December, it, <clears throat> it doesn't take long for Amber to call up the tip line. So she calls it up and she's like, I've been having an affair with Scott. Now this is huge for police, okay? They're like, oh, hell yeah, jackpot. Because they didn't have anything on Scott at this time. While they have Amber on the line, they ask her like, hey, would you be willing to record your phone calls with Scott? And she agrees. Scott calls Amber on New Year's Eve. Mind you, he's at Lacey's candlelight vigil. They're having it at the park, okay? Scott's there. He calls up Amber, New Year's Eve. <laughs> Sorry, you get it. Anyways, so I just couldn't believe this is what he, uh, call, mm-hmm, yes, you get it. Anyway, so he calls her up. He tells her he's in Paris and it's just incredible. So, hold on, I don't like that lip. So he's in Paris, so he says, you know? And the call is pretty short, it's not that long, but it was recorded, so, mm-hmm. You're not embarrassed. So meanwhile, during all of this, divers are searching the bay waters and over the course of the next few weeks, they would end up searching the waters 15 different times, but would come up with nothing. On another recorded phone call with Amber, she's expressing to Scott like how frustrated she is with him, that he lied, he was married and she was pregnant. She's telling this to Scott. He then tells Amber on the phone that he took a polygraph test and he passed it and that Lacey knew he was having an affair and she had accepted it. <laughs> what an idiot. Sure, buddy, sure. On January 13th, the media got word that there was a mistress involved. They ended up running a story about Amber. On January 24th, Amber was forced to come out to the public with a statement due to the harassment she was receiving. Many believed that she was doing this for attention, thought it was selfish, thought she was just trying to get something out of this. But Amber was like, people are accusing me of being involved and stuff. Like I have to come out and give a statement if I wanna take some control of her involvement. But even after she came out and gave her statement, people still ripped her to shreds and thought it was for Again, for selfish reasons, you literally cannot win. So after Amber came forward, Lacey's family also came out with a public statement, now showing more doubt in Scott's story and his involvement. They really didn't think that he was responsible for this, like not at all. Police at this time had placed secretly a GPS tracker on Scott's car and they were following his every little move. Scott had made five different trips out to the Bay Marina. He would pull up to the same exact spot, sometimes staying there for a while and other times for just like a few minutes. Many believed that he was going out there to see if the police had found anything. Others thought that maybe he was going out there to look at the water and clear his mind. We're not really sure. All of the news about Lacey's disappearance, the affair, Scott being weird. There was so much media coverage on this, which led to Scott Peterson sitting down with Diane Sawyer for TV interview on January 23rd. 28th, 2003. During this interview, he confessed to the affair, but said that he had told Amber the truth, that he was married and just tried to clear his name. Now during this inter <laughs> during the interview, Scott gets a little emotional and starts to cry. But of course, everyone at home was like ripping apart his little cry session because during the interview, he's like, tears are running down his face. But not once did he wipe the tears from his face. And I know that may sound dumb, but investigators explained it in a way I never thought of. He let the tears run down his face and most people would go and like wipe the tears. Like it's kind of, it's just a reaction. You really have to think about it. Like don't wipe the tears, let it drip. Especially if you're on TV, like you're already insecure that you have a camera on you, there's lights, someone's interviewing you. Like you're already feeling kind of insecure. So most people would wipe their tears away, but Scott just let the tears stream down his face. It just felt like he wanted his tears to be seen. After this, Scott was laying pretty low, but then a car dealership comes forward saying that Scott just sold Lacey's car and then purchased a new truck. 
not a good look. Two more women later come forward saying that they too also had an affair with Scott within the last couple of years. Both had similar stories. Scott would wine and dine them, make them feel real special. And then once they found out that he was actually married, they dumped him. In February of 2003, that's when police asked Amber to stop recording the calls with Scott. They were worried that it might be used against her if they go to court, but Amber's phone records show that he was still calling pretty damn often. On February 10th, that would have been Lacey's due date for baby Connor. With great sadness, the family and friends had a, another like candlelight vigil at the park for Lacey and Connor. February 10th was also Amber Fry's birthday. Scott spent his day getting Amber a birthday gift and trying to meet with her. On February 18th, police were able to get another search warrant for Scott's house. And they don't really find anything other than like Scott had subscribed to a bunch of porn channels on his TV. Of course, the media was like, oh my God, Satan, Satan loves porn. The media seemed to focus pretty heavily on this porn thing, a little too much. So they don't really find anything during this search, but they were able to get some of Lacey's hair from her hairbrush in hopes to match the hair in the pliers that were found at Scott's work. So they needed her hair. In March, that is when the forensic team was able to determine that the hair in the pliers was consistent with Lacey's hair in her hairbrush. But they couldn't say 100% it was hers because it did. It was missing the follicle. So on April 13th, on the Northern side of the Bay Shore, a small body was found. And then the next day, a full body was found one mile south, washed up on the Bay Shore. Investigators confirm that it was indeed Lacey and Connor's body. Lacey's head and different limbs were missing. Connor was missing from Lacey's body, but for the most part, his body was in intact, which led investigators to believe that he may have been inside of Lacey for many months after their death. It's believed that Lacey was sunk with cement anchors, similar to the ones that Scott knew how to make. There is no official cause of death because her body was in such bad shape. And they also like never found anchors or anything. Oh my God, what if she wasn't even, what if, what if they just like dropped it there? Sorry. <laughs> I was just thinking. Police felt they had enough evidence to make an arrest, but at this point, Scott was nowhere to be found, okay? He had disappeared. Luckily for at police though, they were able to track Scott's whereabouts through his cell phone and realize that he was down in San Diego. Now they were trying to move fast because they were thinking that Scott was going to make a run for the border and head to Mexico. So they're trying to get out there quick. And they were able to locate Scott at a golf club and his appearance was completely different. He dyed his hair. He dyed all of his hair blonde, including his eyebrows. And now he had a goatee that he also dyed blonde. It was more like orange because he didn't tone. 